morning, Pioneer Drive, on this holiday weekend. We're glad that you're here and that you're in worship with us uh, this morning. Uh, I'm thankful for the team we get to work with. Christy Stanton earlier this week emailed me, do we have time for a baptism on Sunday? I'm like, do we have time for a baptism? That's less I have to preach. Of course we got time for a baptism. That's what we're all about here at Pioneer Drive, and so I'm thankful to her. And you know, this week as I was packing and we were going out of town, uh, the month of June for the Witten family was a month of significant stress for us in a lot of different ways. Some of you have had it far worse. We're not trying to compare just for us. We had the strep apocalypse in our house. We had staph infection. We had stomach bug. I mean, we just named the list. And, and for me, as I was packing and listening to some of the songs that we sing here at the gathering, it was just such a worshipful experience. And so I'm thankful to Craig and Tiffany and their crew uh, for leading us each week. You may not remember the sermons uh, that we preach here, but you can remember the songs, and you can listen to those, and those speak truth to us week in, uh, week out, and so I'm thankful for our worship team for, for leading us. This morning, uh, we are continuing our series entitled Cultivate. We've looked at different virtues that we're uh, trying to cultivate in our life, and this morning we're going to look at cultivating forgiveness. June 17th, 2015, 21-year-old gunman, a white supremacist, walked into Mother Emanuel Church, Charleston, South Carolina, killed nine, wounded three others. The relatives of people slain inside that historic African-American church there in Charleston were able to speak directly to the accused gunman at his first hearing. One by one, those who chose to speak at that bond hearing did not turn to anger. Instead, while he remained passive, they offered him forgiveness. They said they were praying for his soul, even as they described the pain of their loss. How is that kind of forgiveness possible? How do we forgive like that? I'm glad you asked. There's a scene in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, Jesus has been teaching, and one of his disciples named Peter comes up to him and says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, in Peter's faith tradition, the consensus was that you would forgive somebody three times. But after that, you didn't have to anymore. And so Peter here is hearing Jesus talk about forgiveness and comes thinking, I've just doubled that. I'm doing really well. I've doubled that and I've added to it seven. Seven in the Bible often symbolizes completion. And so Peter is thinking, I'm, I'm going above and beyond seven times. But Jesus responded to him, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. What Jesus is saying is that his followers are to forgive countless times. Because followers of Jesus forgive without keeping score. And then he goes on to tell a parable. And that's what we're going to study this morning, beginning in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. Jesus speaking, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. As we're reading this parable, we need to think with a theme of judgment. As Jesus is talking, uh, we, we learn about this man who owes 10,000 bags of gold. Now, folks much f smarter than me have done the financial calculation here, and this is an incalculable debt. Uh, the amount here might be equivalent to somewhere over $2 billion. Dramatic. And this first servant has no ability to repay. What would happen is that he would have to sell his family into slavery, even his own children into slavery. Perhaps to the creditor, maybe to others. A, a debtor's slavery was often designed more as punishment than it was repayment for using these funds and not being able to return them. And so the first man, this first servant, asks for patience. Hey, give me some time. I'll repay the debt. Well, the king has pity. 
His mercy. He gives the servant what he doesn't deserve. You see, this scene is a powerful display of the forgiveness of God, about how much God forgives those who have offended God, which every single one of us have in some way, shape, or form. And so this servant gets the unthinkable. This servant gets their insurmountable debt forgiven. It's wiped free and clear. The books are completely clean. The debt has been canceled. If you're a Monopoly player, they got the get-out-of-jail-free card. Their life was headed towards prison. Their, their, their life was headed possibly towards slavery, and now they get to go a completely different direction. Their debts have been canceled. A reason to rejoice. But Jesus continues with the story. Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? But he refused. Instead, he went out and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And went and told their master everything that had happened. So the first servant gets forgiven the unthinkable tremendously. And then he goes and finds another servant who owes him a hundred denarii. Again, people much smarter than me have done the calculation. First guy's debt, first servant's debt was in the billions perhaps. Comparatively speaking, this, this is like you know, $4,000. This, this guy's worried about a couple rats in the house. It's raining elephants outside. And people are outraged because they see. Do you like watching double standards? You see a standard that someone holds someone else to, and then they turn around and hold, hold them to a different standard? I mean, that, there's something in us that, that just are the, the, the justice bones inside of us just start to cry out and start to shake and say, that, that's just not right. This guy has been forgiven a billion dollar debt. It's, it's the equivalent of him having uh, planes and trains and automobiles and multiple houses. And he gets to go free and clear. And then he turns around to a guy he let have a donut this morning and throws him in prison because he didn't pay him for the 50 cent donut. It's a complete double standard. And so the, the first servant, the one who's been forgiven, that's been given free and clear, that had a, a, new, a new path, a new, new story that was unfolding in his life, then goes to this person who owes him this $4,000 debt and says, pay back what you owe me. That second servant pleads almost identical to the first servant. He asks for leniency. He asks for patience. But instead of reacting and, and acting in grace and compassion with the mercy that he'd received. He delivers punishment. Instead of selling this man into slavery, he does even worse. He throws him into the debtor's prison and even more severe punishment. So Jesus says in verse 32, Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Jesus adds this, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. The king is outraged at the lack of mercy. I mean, wouldn't you? The mercy and benevolence of the master of the king towards the first servant should have so impacted the forgiven's life, that he would show mercy and benevolence to, to others. His wicked nature has only taken selfish advantage of the situation, and now he's going to receive the punishment. He's going to be tortured over to the tortures. He's going to experience judgment forever. And so what Jesus is trying to get Peter to understand, and what I believe he's trying to get us to understand, is that we should forgive because the reality of our own forgiveness is demonstrated in the way God has forgiven us. 
that Jesus wants his disciples to respond mercifully. You know, I'm often asked, what's the difference between mercy and grace? Mercy is not giving a person what they deserve. Mercy is not giving a person what they deserve. The first man, first servant, should have received slavery, could have received prison time, didn't get it. Uh, Ely and I were dating uh, several years ago. It was uh, that time we were moving in our relationship towards engagement. And so there were some you know, boxes you need to check. One of those is you need to go visit with a family, right? And so I was trying to sneak away so Elia didn't know, and I had a short window of time to get down to San Angelo, and I was going uh, really fast, and I was late. And the last thing you want to do at that meeting with grandparents and, and parents present and siblings present is be late, right? And so I was going through Rowena or Miles, one of these really small towns, and I'm headed, and I'm going, you know, a slow 60 and a 45, something like that. And I see the lights, and, and, and the blue lights and the red lights light up, and I see the highway patrolman, and he, he gets behind me, pulls me over, and I, I'm just always honest. I'm always honest with him, and I'm thinking, I've, I'll never have this chance again to play this card, and so I'm going to play this card. And so he, he comes up to my window, and he says, uh, sir, you, you know, you were going pretty fast. And I said, I, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm really sorry. He said, well, is there a reason? I said, well, I'm thinking, I'm glad you asked. Now I get to play my card. You just asked for it. I said, yes, well, I'm, I'm actually late. I'm, I'm headed to propose to my, uh, my girlfriend's family in St. Angelo. And he said, well, sir, um, you know, slow down. Uh, I want you to be safe and good luck. Whew. That was mercy. I deserved that ticket, and I'll just be honest. Anytime I've been pulled over, I've deserved that ticket. I've received a lot of mercy uh, in my life, more than I want to share up here. Um, but uh, that's mercy. Uh, grace uh, would be a little bit different. Uh, grace is giving to a person what they do not deserve. In my situation, grace would have been the police officer saying, Hey, I got ice cream. Uh, have fun. Enjoy that. Or, Hey, follow me. I'm going to give you an escort. I know you're running. That would have been grace. I'll settle for mercy in that situation. What Jesus wants his disciples to understand is that a person who has truly experienced God's mercy and God's grace will live a different kind of life. The scorecard of life will look different for the person who's been transformed by the grace of Christ Jesus. That transformed heart will seek to give that same mercy and grace to other people. But, but a person who's not fully experienced God's grace and mercy will not be able to experience that forgiveness if they aren't willing to share it. It'll only be superficial. And so mercy and grace intertwine at forgiveness. They intertwine at forgiveness. And this is one of the most difficult practices in our world. Forgiveness. Because what Jesus is talking about here is not some kind of conditional acceptance. Well, if you'll do this, I'll accept you. It's an unqualified, they didn't deserve it. It's an unqualified removal of all that we hold against other people. An unqualified removal of all that we hold against other people. And again, th this is really hard. We're going to be honest. It's church. We can be honest here, okay? It's hard. It's hard. Because we know the wounds, don't we? We know what they did. We have baggage. I have baggage, you have baggage, we all have baggage that we bring. It's real, that hurt is real. What happened to you wasn't right. The hurt in an offended relationship is absolutely real. Or it wouldn't be a hurt. And the human nature is, we don't want to be hurt again, that's obvious. I don't want to be hurt again. They took the money and ran. She left me for him. Dad hit me growing up. Mom neglected me. They abused me in ways I can't speak of. They gave me a dirty look. They don't invite me. They said something one time. It gets to the core of us. It settles into the bone. Forgiveness in our world is often conditionally based on the action of the perpetrator. Well, if you'll do, if they'll do, 
And we even say things like, you know what, I'll settle the score. I'll, I'll get even. I'll, they're they're going to regret they ever did this. As I heard it said recently, hate is the mask that fear wears to look through. And I think deep down inside of us, there's a fear. A fear of being hurt again. A fear of them winning. A fear of them getting us. It causes us to hate. To not forgive. To harbor resentment. And it makes me wonder if the opposite of forgiveness is revenge. And revenge is saying, God, I don't trust you. God, I think I know better than you. God, I think I can settle this score better than you can. And and so you know what I'm going to do, God? I'm going to lock them in prison, a metaphorical prison for what they did to me, a symbolic prison for what they did to me. And for some of us, that all our life is spent locking these people up. They've done something, and it's been uh, thinking through how we can manipulate them and manage them and, and, and get back at them and, and, and show them and settle the score one day and how when we have that one encounter, we're just going to unload the dump truck on them. But Jesus shows us a different way, doesn't he? That when we experience God's forgiveness the unqualified removal of all that we have done wrong, it will absolutely influence and impact how we treat other people around us. You see, mercy experience produces mercy demonstrated. Mercy experienced produces mercy demonstrated. And so one of the keys to forgiveness is to stop focusing on what they have done to us and instead focus on what Jesus has done for us. You see, whatever happened to you yesterday or or five years ago or five months ago or 50 years ago does not have to define your life. It doesn't have to. So we focus on what Jesus has done for us. But secondly, when we forgive someone we set them free. And in turn, we free ourselves. You know, forgiveness is at the core of who God is. We just celebrated God's forgiveness through baptism this morning. It was, what a wonderful uh, celebration that is. But it is God's nature. It is who God is to forgive. God preemptively struck the, the human condition with an offer of grace, with an offer of mercy, with an offer of forgiveness. And so Jesus throws the world on end when he urges his followers to also be people of forgiveness, to be people of grace rather than people of revenge. In fact... Our ability to forgive others is a good litmus test as to how much we understand what God has done for us. For the Jesus follower, forgiveness has no limits. Lewis Smedes writes, To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. To forgive is to set a prisoner free And to discover that that prisoner was you. You know, one of the most scandalous fallouts of Easter's grace is that God forgives all kinds of people that you wouldn't. And the way we love people we don't agree with, the way we love people who've harmed us the most, is the best evidence that the tomb is really empty. When people look at your life and they say, we know exactly what they did to that person, and yet they are still showing up, they are still choosing forgiveness, they are not turning to hate and continuing the cycles. You know, the Bible, G.K. Chesterton said, tells us to love our neighbors. It also tells us to love our enemies, often because those are the same people. Simon Wiesenthal was a Jew. He was brought face to face with a young, dying Nazi officer who described an atrocity, herding hundreds of Jews into a home, blowing the home up with grenades, hearing the screams, and watching small children die. When the Nazi officer, to make peace with himself, pleaded for forgiveness from Wiesenthal because he was a Jew, Wiesenthal walked away without offering the man one ounce of hope of forgiveness. A woman is abused by her husband. Is she to forgive him? A neighbor is asked to care for a home when a family is on vacation. Goes through the drawers, steals the money. The family learns of it. Is the Christian family to forgive the neighbor and then ask that same neighbor to take care of their home the next time? The question gets down to what does forgiveness really look like? Scott McKnight in his book, The Jesus Creed, talks about two different kinds of forgiveness. The first one he talks about is objective forgiveness. He refers to the elimination of the offense in the relationship. This is where reconciliation is possible. Objective 
forgiveness. The second he talks about is subjective forgiveness. It includes a disposition to forgive in our heart and the experience of forgiving. It lets go of the anger and the resentment and the rage. It ends the internal cycle of the offense. What we hope is that as followers of Jesus, we release those negative emotions and that it leads to objective forgiveness. But it doesn't always lead to objective forgiveness. It doesn't always lead to reconciliation. You know, the, the writer of Proverbs uh, says it this way, and I think it's a, a really profound uh, illustration and disgusting illustration, if I might add, but appropriate. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats their folly. And I, I see this sometimes in, in marriage counseling. I see this in, in, in Christian circles a lot that some folks think forgiveness means returning to their folly, returning to the people who continue to abuse and abuse and exploit and manipulate. And that's not forgiveness. Yes, it's releasing those negative emotions, but it's working to end those cycles and to not be a victim. And so I want you to think this morning who do you need to forgive? Put that person in your mind. Put that group in your mind. Maybe you've locked a person or a group into your prison. And maybe you're discovering the Holy Spirit's leading you to this morning to realize maybe you're the one in prison. But I want you to think about those wounds and those scars that you're carrying around, those burdens that you have. I, I know we've got them. We all do. And I want you to think now, how might we go about cultivating some forgiveness? Okay? No, number one, confront the offense and the offender's responsibility. There can be no genuine forgiveness. There can be no genuine reconciliation until a person confronts who did what. This is a necessity. We shove offensive and abusive situations into hidden pockets of our heart. It only gets nastier, like an infection that goes untreated. So name it. Stealing, abuse, fraud. It's wrong. Reconciliation cannot be hurried and it cannot be glossed over. And this is a step I see a lot of folks miss because the, the rug is, is, is awful nice and tempting to just lift up the rug and start shoving stuff under the rug. Close the rug, we're all good. That is not forgiveness. And I see that mask of forgive, fake forgiveness, pseudo-forgiveness, worn all the time in church life. And yet you bring it up two years, five years later, and wah. Yeah, there wasn't forgiveness. Number two, the victim must be able to recognize the impact. And this is not just a one-time, one-conversation thing, especially in, in, in relationships where there's been a, a tremendous hurt. We have to realize what the offense has done to the relationship. We have to rebuild trust. Sometimes it's harmed the relationship. Sometimes it has completely severed the relationship, as in marital infidelity can do that. So the victim has to be able to recognize the impact not only once, but has to be able to bring it back up. Number three, the victim chooses to pursue objective forgiveness, where we, we do want to reconcile. Hopefully, Paul says to live at peace with everyone, that as Christians, our desire is going to be to live. At, hopefully, we'd love to reconcile, uh, that to see that other person as a human being who sinned and, and choose to pursue objective forgiveness and, and reconcile the relationship. Hopefully, that melts the heart of the offender. Strive for justifiable reconciliation. Uh, it's a lovely idea until we actually have to do it, right? Until we're actually sitting there face to face with that person or know that a meeting is coming up with them. But we're reminded of Jesus' love for sinners, forgiving even those who hung him on the cross. And so we're challenged to reconcile um, as far as it depends on us. But again, it doesn't mean continuing in cycles of abuse in any way, shape, or form. Uh, number, number five, as we choose a posture of forgiveness, what it does is it creates an alternative reality. But what happens is we choose to forgive. It unleashes a flow of love to the other. When we are forgiven by those whom we have offended, we suddenly become alive internally in a way we did not expect. It creates cycles of grace. And that's what we want to be producing as Christians. As people of Jesus, cycles of grace, not cycles of hate, not cycles of resentment, not cycles of anger. 
Now, some of us could be in a situation, and I think this is, we need to always, before we seek to reconcile, or as we reconcile, realize we all have a part to play. Very few times is that one person's 100% guilty and the other person's 0%. There are times, especially in situations of abuse, child abuse, things like that, there are times when it's 100% zero, but oftentimes it's not quite as clear. And so perhaps you might take the first step, and you've been kind of waiting on some conditional forgiveness. Well, when they do, and when they say, and when they admit, and when they quit, what if you owned your part of it? Take responsibility for you. You can't take responsibility for them. You can take responsibility for you and owned your part and led the way. It's humility. It's forgiveness. The other thing, it's not on the screen, but that you can do. Maybe you're saying, you know, John, right now I don't have a really intense relationship that, that, that I need to work through forgiveness with. I would ask you to examine that and maybe ask you, are you avoiding? Is there some people at work, some people in your life, some people in your family that you're avoiding? Because maybe the way you've dealt with that is you've just avoided them and you've acted like everything's fine. Some of us are really good at that. And, and you need to, the Holy Spirit would say, you need to go in and you need to make it, make it right. Uh, the other thing I would say is sometimes our family of origin are the, fa- are the places where our relationships are the most intense. And so maybe you're saying, well, I don't have some big wrong that's been done, but maybe, maybe I, I, I have kind of been a little bit distant from my family. One of the things you can do is lean into your family of origin. If, if, if your parents are still around or even extended family, aunts, uncles, children, grandchildren, lean into those relationships because it's often within those relationships when we kind of avoid the most and we, we put on the fake smile the most. But you don't even necessarily have to go in there with an, any kind of agenda, but just lean into those relationships. And as you learn to navigate that intense relationship, that knows you very well, you know them very well, you know what they've done, they know what you've done, then you'll probably discover in your life you'll have the tools to better navigate the hard relationships we have day to day. And so just leaning into some of those relationships instead of running away from them can actually be a really helpful practice that ends up cultivating healthier relationships and the ability to speak and be assertive, but also the ability to be humble and say, you know what, I messed it up here. It was Karl Barth Bart, who was once asked, well, I see those I love in heaven. And he said, not just those I love. Desmond Tutu, a bishop in South Africa, won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work against apartheid. In his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, he shared stories and insights from his leadership role in South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. South Africa had been plagued for generations by terrible violence between the white ruling minority and the black majority. Once the whites relinquished power and Mandela became president, the question in need of an answer was clear. How does a country with so much pain and violence and division in its past move forward? Tutu and others established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a way forward. The goal was for those who had committed these atrocities in the past to come forward and to tell the truth, both blacks and whites. But it didn't end there. After confessing the truth, the goal was to bring reconciliation and forgiveness, to break the cycles of hate so the entire country could move forward. In one chapter of the book, Tutu recounts testimony after testimony of people, both black and white, who came before the commission to confess to torturing and even murder of others. It was horrible. Graphic stories and graphic detail. It was almost impossible to believe that human beings were capable of such evil. The horrors of the crimes make one particular story especially moving. Two people who came before the commission were Mrs. Collada and her daughter. Mrs. Collada's husband had been an advocate for black South Africans in rural communities. And because of his work, he'd been arrested, detained, and tortured by the police numerous times. But one day he disappeared. On the front page of the newspaper, Mrs. Collada saw a photograph of her husband's car on fire. She cried so loudly during the hearing, describing the autopsy's report of his torture, that the commission had to be adjourned. When they reconvened, Mrs. Collada's daughter testified. Years had gone by. She was now a young lady. She pleaded with the commission to discover who killed her father. But she was not crying out because she wanted vengeance. Instead, 
she said to the commission, we want to forgive, we just don't know whom to forgive. That's forgiveness. Eventually, some members of the police confessed to the crime. Rather than continue the endless cycles of hatred, Mrs. Collada and her daughter forgave the men who tortured and killed their husband and father because that is what Christ's people do. Does forgiveness mean we don't care about justice? Absolutely not. Does forgiveness mean there is no consequence for evil? Absolutely not. Does forgiveness mean we continue to allow ourselves to be abused? Absolutely not. What it means is that we leave vengeance in God's hands. That that God alone is the noble judge. That he is the one who can judge rightly. And that our job as his agents of the kingdom of God on earth is to break the cycles of hate. To move from a people of exclusion to a people of embrace. Just as God in Christ Jesus has wrapped his arms around us, he has embraced us and he loves us with an everlasting love. And that is our job to the world. Mark Twain, who said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Let's pray. Lord, I just sense in this room, among our church family, our culture, there's just a lot beneath the surface. They did. She did. He did. They want to. They hate. They don't like. There's just so much brewing. And it spills out. And it lashes out. And it, and it seeks vengeance. And, and it's stewed in anger. And it's understandable. We see a lot of wrongs done. A lot of evil done. And so I just sense that in this room, there's that baggage that's here and that's heavy today. God, that's not how you chose to live. Harboring anger and resentment is not your way. It's not the way you call us to. So Lord, help us this week, today, to be people of grace, to be people of mercy, to be people of forgiveness. That the mercy we've experienced in you would be mercy that is demonstrated toward the other in our life, toward the others in our life. And so, Lord, we praise you for your grace and your forgiveness that does not hold our sin against us anymore. In Christ Jesus, we praise you for that. But help that grace and mercy and forgiveness flow to others who have wronged us deeply. Let us be known at Pioneer Drive here in the big country and beyond as people who cultivate a holy, a heavenly forgiveness. It's in the name of Jesus that we offer our prayer. Amen.